the heart of Arabia. In ancient times, this sea of sand and rock experienced successive waves of immigration, which fashioned the history of the Middle East. Human presence here dates back over a million years, but gradually man pulled back to the outer edges where more fertile land was to be found. These greener lands attracted other tribes and peoples. Amorites, Arameans, Ammonites, Moabites, Edomites, Nabataeans and Hebrews. Cited hundreds of times in the Bible, these peoples all spoke the same language, the tongue of Sem, the son of Noah. There were many different Semitic dialects. A holy land situated between the Mediterranean and the Arabian Desert, a corridor between two great centers of civilization, Egypt and Mesopotamia, this area, now known as Transjordan, was always a communication link between Africa and Asia. Better known as the Royal Road, this has been a vital route since biblical times. But what evidence is there of this today, of its distant mythical past? recounts that after having fled from Egypt, the nation of the Jews, led by Moses, wandered to the east of the River Jordan, across the lands of Edom and Moab, before finding their promised land. For today's traveler, Jordan still represents images which exemplify the land of the Bible. But what do recent archaeological revelations add to our understanding of the places which appear in the Holy Scriptures? En route for the most famous of them all, our team travels this royal road with a first stop at the Dead Sea and the sites which are believed to be Sodom and Gomorrah, towns famous for their debauchery. The Bible tells us that it was here that Lot, the nephew of Abraham, and his daughters took refuge after God destroyed the two cities. Let's go back a bit. Lot, who lived in Sodom, had tried in vain to convince his people to flee the city before Yahweh's wrath at their dissipation would destroy them all. When the city crumbled under fire and brimstone, two angels led Lot and his family outside the city and warned them not to look back. But Lot's wife ignored their warning and did look back. She was immediately turned into a pillar of salt. The old man and his daughters then sought refuge in a cave. The young women, the only survivors of this cataclysm, mated with their father to ensure the continuation of their bloodline. According to the book of Genesis, this incestuous act gave rise to the two peoples who would dominate Transjordan, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Mustafa Kiwan, our guide, takes us to the place where Lot and his daughters are thought to have taken refuge. What traces are left today of this ancient story? 
Historically and archaeologically, there is absolutely nothing to prove this story. Neither the Moabites nor the Ammonites left any traces or written texts about their origins. We only have biblical texts. So how much credibility can we give to this Bible story? The story of Lot and his marriage to his daughters is clearly a legend. When we discovered Lot's cave and examined it, we could only say that it was a Bronze Age tomb, simply a site which dates back to 3,000 years before Jesus Christ. If you like, they adapted an old story of an earthquake to give a moral lesson to people. Probably, the Hebrews later invented the person of Lot to humiliate the Moabites and the Ammonites, saying they were of incestuous blood. They were the sworn enemies of the Israelites, who wanted to present them as bastards. For example, they called them Moabites, and in their language, Moab is the name for a fatherless child. Among the tribes who settled to the east of the Jordan, the Ammonites and the Moabites rapidly established themselves in the areas which are known today as Kerak and Amman. Their two territories, already kingdoms by 1200 BC, bordered the royal road along which the Hebrews would follow Moses after the Exodus to find their promised land. After a long nomadic period in directions which are still unknown, the children of Israel would raise their tents in the Moab steppes, probably in the Jordan Valley near Jericho. It was probably here at Mount Nebo that Moses announced that he had finally found their promised land, but entry was forbidden to Moses himself. And Yahweh, the God, said to him, this is the land which I promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in these terms. I will give it to your children. I let you see it with your eyes, but you will not go in. It was here in the land of the Moabites that Moses would die before he entered the promised land. Important research has been carried out in this region for more than 50 years to verify phrases from the Bible and to place them on the map. Above all, the episode of the Exodus. According to Israeli researchers, it is unimaginable that the entire Jewish people escaped unnoticed from Egypt under the noses of the Egyptian frontier guards. Such a movement of people would have left traces of campsites. So today, there is no tangible evidence which supports the long pilgrimage of the Hebrews to their promised land. The Bible stories were written too long after the real events. They are post-exile, 1,200 years after it really happened. Even by that time, people no longer understood Hebrew. The language had disappeared, and so they rewrote the Bible in Aramaean. Even the early Christians never read the Bible in its original Hebrew text. They didn't understand it, and turned to Greek translations in the second century AD. And they contain many errors, errors of translation. Just one example of this mistranslation. The Armenian text says a young woman will give birth to the Savior. In fact, the word halma, which means young woman, is translated in Greek as palzenos, or young virgin. Often, biblical texts reinterpret even older Jewish texts. For example, the flood is a readaptation of an ancient Sumerian writing that describes an exceptional flooding of the Tigris and the Euphrates, and that dates back to 7000 BC. 
We can't accept Bible stories as real history, but only as religious stories, which were designed to push simple people to accept a single God in place of a panoply of idols. And so the objective was to forget all the ancient beliefs and accept the new law of Judaism. Centuries later, when the region was under Roman domination, the birth of a savior would mark the emergence of a new religion. It came to pass in these days that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and he was baptized in the river of Jordan. Mark, one of the authors of the New Testament, never explained on which side of the river this major event in the life of Jesus took place. This has been long argued. The debate has been intense. But in 1996, the actual site of the baptism was identified as being on the East Bank, and this was subsequently accepted by the Vatican. We have tried to establish the archaeological proof of this. We started digging in 1996 to discover these remains, and last, we discovered here 10 churches, five caves, baptismal pools, roots, and other remains such as water system, cisterns, and aqueducts. All these remains dated back to Roman and Byzantine period, which means from the first century till the sixth century AD. So this is a sacred area with its architectural remains. And those archeological remains mentioned by pilgrims and travelers who came and visited this area. The famous pilgrim called Pilgrim of Bordeaux visited the site and he said, where Jesus was baptized is a distance of eight kilometers from the Dead Sea to that spot. And then he said, on the eastern bank of Jordan River, near the river where Jesus was baptized, there is a hill. And there, Elijah ascended to the heavens. So you can come here and fit the description of Bordeaux. And so, the long debate over the exact place of the baptism has been resolved. On the eastern bank or the western bank, or in the midst of the river. I don't think so that Jesus was stood in the midst of the river with John the Baptist in a gushy, muddy, floody, dangerous river. We have evidences from the New Testament. We have in John chapter 1, verses number 28, see clearly, these things were done in Bethany beyond the Jordan. So really refers to the place beyond. And according to those who wrote the Gospels on the Western Bank, beyond means the Eastern Bank. We have now evidences, archaeological evidences, Belgrim's description, and we have the holy text. It's equally probable that John the Baptist chose this side of the Jordan for strategic reasons. He was protecting himself from Orthodox Judaism, which in first century Palestine was extremely divided. The Jews were much less receptive to Jesus' message than the Nabataeans, who occupied the eastern side of the Jordan. They also believed in the coming of their gods by way of virgin birth, and organized ceremonial dinners during which the king personally served 12 guests, like the Last Supper.
It was also in Nabataean territory in Transjordan that Jesus began his ministry, in one of the ten Greco-Roman cities, the Decapole. One of Jesus' first miracles, the healing of a person possessed by the devil, took place at Gadara, according to Matthew, and Gerasa, according to Mark. Critics of the Holy Scriptures have often interpreted this period of Jesus' teaching as an effort to reach out to the entire world, and not only to Jews. Here, he was in Greco-Roman territory. We know little of the development of Christianity in Transjordan in the three centuries that followed, apart from knowing that a scattering of Christian communities were established, mainly around the city of Gerasa. Christian expansion in the region reached its peak in the 5th and 6th centuries, when hundreds of churches and convents were built throughout the region. In 1933, the custodial fathers of the Holy Land began an archaeological dig at the summit of Mount Nebo and discovered the ruins of a memorial. It overlooks the Dead Sea and bears witness to the latter life of Moses after the Exodus. Since its discovery, the site has been visited by thousands of pilgrims from all around the world. They are convinced that the site is authentic, but what has archaeology to say about it? Every year, the convent of the Franciscan Brethren, which faces the memorial, is visited by many theologians and scientists. Father Carmelo invites us into their center of biblical studies. From an archaeological point of view, we know very well that the region was inhabited since prehistory. But we have to jump forward to the Byzantine period to find actual vestiges. The most important ones are the Memorial of Moses, the Basilica built in the 4th century and extended in the 6th century, and the monastery which was built alongside. The archaeological digs at the Basilica have brought to light mosaics dating from 530 AD. Witness to the most flourishing period of Christianity, these works of art portray pastoral scenes, an idealistic vision of the Holy Land. This mosaic, with its great attention to detail, illustrates the evolution of the relationship between man and animal, from primitive hunting to domestication. Here, a shepherd defends a zebu, which is being attacked by lions. And here, a scene depicting a hunt for bear and wild boar. Further over, under the indifferent eye of grazing sheep and goats, two men lead an ostrich, a zebra, and a camel. From an iconographic point of view, the mosaics of Mount Nebo and the Madaba region are very, very important. They are proof that a very refined school of mosaic creation existed here during the Byzantine period. Following this ancient artistic tradition, a new school was created in 1992. Its mission is to restore and preserve the ancient mosaics of Jordan, and especially those of the Madaba Plateau. 
the school, of course, has uh, three main activities in that field. We do the documentation of mosaics all around. We uh, take care about the training of our colleagues from different uh, departments of antiquities in the Arab world to introduce them how to restore mosaics. We do most of the restoration of mosaics in Jordan, and we participate in the different exhibitions that is related to the promoting of mosaic art. Restoring mosaics is a particularly delicate art. It is done in several stages and demands know-how, patience and an extreme delicacy of touch. Some mosaics are a more difficult challenge than others. Everything depends on where they're being restored, in a workshop or in situ. Usually, we start by doing a general observation. We come to the site, we do the assessment of the restoration and the situation the mosaic is in. Second thing, we start the, uh, the restoration. Usually it involves around the cleaning of the surface of the mosaic, of any residues that could be on the surface. We do usually, the taking, we take care about the lacunas and the sides of the mosaic so that we don't lose any kind of tessera during the work. This school isn't situated here just by accident. Madaba, with its dozen churches, is a site where a huge number of mosaics have come to light. They represent scenes which are both religious and profane, even scenes from Greek mythology, such as this one in the Church of the Virgin. The edifice was built at the end of the 6th century, alongside a Roman road. Stone from an older monument was used for its construction. It is one of the most beautifully decorative sites in the entire region. The most historically valuable mosaic is this one, discovered in 1884 at a church which dates from the end of the 6th century. This particular work truly underlines the importance of the mosaics in this region. This important document, and that is truly what it is, gives precious information about Palestine during the Byzantine period. True believers, as well as historians from all around the world, come here to absorb its messages from the past. The map of Madaba is a real geographical map. It gives a bird's eye view of the Holy Land, from Lebanon to the Nile Delta in Egypt. The cities and the most important sites are presented in the form of vignettes, and inscriptions describe the biblical events associated with each place. The ancient tribal regions are also indicated by inscriptions in red, accompanied by the benediction that Moses and Jacob gave to these tribes. The layout of the holy city of Jerusalem is an extremely faithful representation. Here we recognize the Holy Sepulchre, built over the spot where Jesus was crucified. And we also see many of the buildings constructed by the Emperor Justinian. This representation of the Holy City has also provided us with new information. 
For example, before its discovery, we didn't know why the north gate of Jerusalem was called the Columned Gate. This detail reveals the existence of a monument of which no one was aware. Another detail merits attention. This fish is swimming in the Jordan, but it turns around once it reaches the Dead Sea because the extremely salty waters already supported no life forms. Finally, unlike modern maps which always present the Holy Land from north to south, the mosaic maker takes a different axis. He orients the map towards the east. He assumed that visitors would arrive from the Mediterranean, and that corresponds with the route taken by most pilgrims at the time. Over and above its documentary value, the work demonstrates the great artistic savoir-faire of these mosaic makers of Madaba. The artists had no less than 40 different colors of mosaic pieces available to them. It's a unique document and very important because it's guided us in the discovery of churches and other mosaics in the Madaba region. A great number of these churches have been found, demonstrating the profound faith of the first Christians. Maybe the biblical miracles happened along this royal road, maybe not. Nevertheless, it was still the cradle of a world religion, Christianity.